Good evening and welcome to the Monday, August 11, 2014, meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Could we please have the roll call? Chairman Sullivan? Present. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor McCausland? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Wagner? Here. And Councilor Walsh? Here. May we please pledge allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any town council reports or correspondence? Huh? Councilor Sherman? Uh, once again, I had the privilege of uh, running, although not so fast, in uh, this year's installment of the Beach to Beacon, and I just want to thank uh, town uh, police departments, fire departments, public works for all of their great work in supporting this event, as well as the countless citizens who uh, come out and volunteer for the event, as well as cheer uh, runners during the event. It's much appreciated, and it really, to me, is just an example of one of the many examples of why I love living in Cape Elizabeth. It's just a, a great event. It's a real feel-good event. And for people who aren't from our town, who experience it for the first time, uh, they are uh, floored by how much the town supports it. So anyway, uh, kudos to everybody involved in the race. Thank you, Councilor Sherman. Councilor Walsh? Well, I walked the Beach to Beacon. For the first time in 17 years, I decided to join uh, your 15 minute mile, I think I, was, I did pretty well. Uh, but again, being on the outside of the race and then being in the race, I have to tell you my hat's off, just like what uh, Councilor Sherman had to say to the volunteers, to the town uh, fire department, police department, DPW, to the race workers. I, I have to tell you, I was so impressed being on that you know, pavement which a lot of it's new, by the way. Thank you, thank you, Mike. <laughs> uh, and I noticed that how, how it's sort of, you know, concave, and uh, I had to work through that. But I got to tell you, it is an impressive event in every way, shape, or form. And all I can tell you is uh, I was excited about it, and I will do it again next year. And again, I, I'm, my hat's off to everyone who participates in making it happen, because it's an incredible event, and uh, one that I'm now proud to say I've actually participated in rather than observe from a distance. So. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Wagner? I, I only take issue with David's remarks because he read, ran it slightly faster than I did, so. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that slow? It's respectable. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Well, it was uh, a fantastic day, and it, it's an organizational masterpiece, I, I must say. And it's fun, it's happy, and it's safe. So I would like to thank all of the the people that run the Beach to Beacon, that, that organize it, and also our town staff who volunteer and help out and participate. And, and I'll actually turn that over to the town manager to say a few more words about our departments that work so hard to, to make that a successful day. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Sullivan. Yeah, I just want to join in, in thanking all the others that, that the councilors have thanked and acknowledging. Uh, the volunteers, the different departments. Uh, I'm not sure I heard the school department was mentioned, but they provide an awful lot of buses uh, in coordination as well as the use of the school facilities for the registration and uh, without them as well, uh, the race organization would be lost. And the other thing I really want to, uh, important to note is, I, I forget the exact number, I think it was 674, I, I believe. Uh, you've got the number. 674 yeah. okay. runners completed the race, apparently, from, from, Cape. from Cape Elizabeth, including yeah. at least three present uh, <laughs> up here. So anyway, it's, uh, and to me, that's, you know, we, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that goes on around the race and, you know, a lot of hoopla or whatever. But what really matters in the end is that people are out there enjoying the, the view, getting good exercise, uh, practicing for it as well. And you know, for a community that, that values wellness, uh, it's really a signature event. And uh, amongst everything else, I think that's probably the best thing about it. So. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, and there there were a record overall of 6,488 runners. I can't remember how many when it first started. Does anyone recall? About 2,400. 
2400 yeah. so yeah. okay thank you uh, I'd like to just interject at this moment before the finance report and ask our town clerk to mention that the openings that are available in the town council and the school board and what when those papers are due and all that Great, thank you so much. Again, there are nomination papers that are now available for town council and school board. We have two seats available for both boards. They are three-year terms that would begin in December following the November 4th election. Uh, nomination papers are due back in my office by Friday, September 5th, and we do close at 4 p.m. Uh, in order to qualify, you would need to have between 25 and 100 registered voters of Cape Elizabeth nominate you. So if anybody's interested in taking out papers, uh, please see me in my office. I'd be happy to assist you with that process. Okay, thank you. Uh, Finance Committee. Council Walsh. Again, you have um, a rather uh, long packet of information attached to your packets this evening. Uh, again, we're uh, one month into our new fiscal year and uh, nice job budgeting and uh, it looks like we're on track. It's a, a pretty simple exercise in the first month, but uh, again, nothing else to report other than the fact that it's attached for your, for your uh, reading if you so desire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, at this point, it's time for citizens to have an opportunity to discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda. Any citizens wishing to discuss something not on tonight's agenda may approach the, the, the uh, microphone. Seeing none, I'll close that opportunity. And could we have the town manager's report? Yeah, I think I covered it with the brief comments on okay. each week, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item, uh, uh, review of the draft minutes of the previous meeting, which was July 14, 2014. Do I have a motion to approve July 14, 2014 minutes? So Council we'll Walsh? A second? Second. Council Sherman, any corrections or errors? All those in favor? Okay. And th that's cor that's right. Councillor um, McCausen was absent, so six votes in favor of that. Okay. <clears throat> Item number 108, Ocean House Pizza Annual License Application Renewal. Um, I'll let the town clerk introduce this item. Thank you very much. You have before you a renewal application of CAG Pizza Incorporated doing business as Ocean House Pizza. It is their annual liquor license, and I do want to make a clarification that they are requesting a malt and vinous liquor license. I did call the applicant today um, just to make sure um, that it was malt and vinous as they have requested in the past. So uh, hopefully your, um, your order will include that um, clarification. And the applicant is here, should anyone have any questions. Oh, I'm sorry, we have checked with public safety, codes, and fire, and no uh, concerns or questions have been brought forth. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve uh, item number 108, uh, the Ocean House Pizza Annual License Renewal for a Malt and to add v v Vinus or Venice, yes, however you pronounce yes. it, uh, license? Councilor Sherman? Uh, so moved. Is there a second? Seconded. Councilor Walsh? And any discussion, sir? Councillor Wagner? Yeah, I, I just wanted to know if the DBA is registered with the state. It, I don't know if the, D, the CAG Pizza Inc. should be for the incorporation. I, I only asked because I ran into an issue with it recently, and that this, if you uh, approve it without the DBA being approved, the state's going to kick it back to you, and you have to um, get a, a DBA official DBA license with the state. I'm not sure. Perhaps the applicant knows. This is the same as last year, and I don't know if anything's been kicked back to them last year. It's a new uh, liquor inspector. Okay. So I don't know if the applicant knows. We can right here the ask the town manager to comment on that. Yeah, I did. You know, I think that could be checked out by the applicant. The, the, the other question is for you. I had the application that I received only had malt. It did right. That's correct. When I was going over preparing for this evening, I noted that in the past it was a malt and vinous, so I called the applicant today to make sure um, that there were no changes. So it's both? Correct, yes. Yep. So I guess it's more of an admonition to the applicant that 
if you don't have a DBA, you're probably going to get a kick back to you, and you'll have to then apply for a DBA. But that's something for you to deal with. Okay. Thank you. Any Is other? the the DBA you were asking about was for Ocean House Pizza? Right. Uh, I mean, I just did a corporate name search, and I think it captures DBAs as well, and it came up with no hits. So you you ought to take a look at that. Just to be on the safe side. <laughs> okay. Anything else? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. We now come to the public hearing. Definition of normal high water mark and the zoning ordinance. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, before I open the hearing, I'm going to ask Councilor Ray, who's chairman of the ordinance committee, just to say a few words and about this, and then we can go right into the public hearing. Okay, great. Um, I just want to say that the, um, we were very lucky to have the full participation of the council at a um, meeting of the Ordinance Committee on May 29th, where we heard from Pete Slavinsky, his presentation, and I again want to thank the total council for coming to that, because I think that was very helpful. Um, and um, I'm going to ask uh, Maureen O'Mara later, uh, you will, mm -hmm. to give a brief presentation about the highlights of this, so. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Ray. Okay, at this time, um, I want to remind those who like wishing to speak that they have three-minute maximum, that we all conduct ourselves with courtesy and respect to other citizens. Please do not comment on what anyone speaking is saying. And if, um, if there appear to be quite a few people that would like to speak, it would be very helpful if you would line up on that wall so that we can proceed you know, um, fairly quickly. So at this time, I'll open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to address the council on the definition of normal high watermark and in the zoning ordinance amendment proposal? <laughs> Could you give us your name and address, please? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Bill DeSena, and I live at 11 Wainwright Drive, Cape Elizabeth. Um, and I don't understand the... Um, intent or purpose here, but as I read the only thing that I uh, have any knowledge of is the letter sent on July 28th. Um, as I read it through the second time, it concerned me that there's a three-foot vertical rise, <clears throat> and um, my property is six acres which I paid for three, approximately three, I don't know, maybe two um, acres are into the Rachel Carson wetland preserve, which I own and have been paying taxes on for <clears throat> since 2004. Um, and I guess my, if, if this ordinance is going to be denying me my right of ownership, which I've been paying taxes for and purchased, then I have an objection to it. If it does not, then I have no problems with it. And the reason I have objections to it, obviously, is that I've been paid, I did pay for it, and I have been paying taxes. And as you all know, my wife is a, a conservation person, and we have been using it for her little footpaths throughout the entire wetland. Um, and actually sit out there in mosquito-fested things and look at the sanctuary in front of us. Anyway, um, that's my only comment. If it's going to take my property rights as the owner or diminish those in any way, then I would object. Otherwise, I have no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Olson, and I live at 98 Wells Road. That's on the Sawyer Road end of Wells, so my property abuts the Spurwink Marsh. Um, my concern is the same as the three-foot elevation. Um, my property is very low. Uh, I think down where it meets the marsh is probably even with the marsh. And the rise is very long up to my house. So I think I'm concerned that it would go up into my property and perhaps um, prohibit 
building on to the back side of my house if it's not if it doesn't allow what is it 75 feet <laughs> or and anyway it's a, it's basically the same concern is how far up would it go on my property is it going to interfere with my rights as a property owner um, and my question for the town would be are you going to send someone over to my house to meet with me and to show me where where the lines are, where the new lines would be with this proposal, and how it would impact my land. Okay, thank you. Good evening, my name is Richard Bryant and I live at 55 Spurwink Avenue in Cape Elizabeth uh, with my wife, Jean Najami. Um, I sent a, a letter to the council this this afternoon, right around noon today, and I saw there was a typo in the data. And I've got corrected versions if anyone would like to have that, but pass that along. Um, my concern with this ordinance is that I think that the proposed modification in its current form is a retreat from the environmental protection that we've uh, already have in our statute uh, with respect to coastal shoreland areas. When you substitute a HAST plus three or a HAT plus three, whatever definition that's based on a still water line, for the existing definition in the ordinance, which talks about the apparent extreme limit of the effects of the tides, by necessity, you are changing the 75 foot setback in those areas of the shoreline which have a rocky ledge uh, at which the current zoning map and the current zoning definition places the start of the shoreland zone at the top of the, of the rocky ledge, or what's often called the top of the bank. In every instance in which you choose a line which is based upon the uh, astronomical high tide line, you're going to be further down that ledge, which shifts the entire 250-foot shoreland zone closer to the ocean. It shifts the 75-foot setback in which there are restrictions upon impervious surfaces closer to the ocean and takes up some cases, nearly all of that 75-foot setback with what are impervious surfaces that are there now, the existing rocky ledge. I think it's important for the council to understand the reason that rocky ledges exist on our shoreline is not because of a definition that you've created or the state has created or because somebody drew a line on the map. The reason those ledges are there is that is the effect of the tides, the scouring of the waves, uh, persistent wind action, the salt spray upon that water that prevents the accumulation of organic materials or soil that would allow terrestrial vegetation. And our shoreland ordinance was designed to do two things. One is to prevent people from putting up buildings that get washed away in the big storms or with the big waves. Um, but the second and equally important rationale behind our shoreland ordinance is to prevent the elimination or the reduction of pervious surfaces that act as a buffer to prevent pollutants coming from impervious surface and going into the, the watershed. Um, and by necessity, when you shift that 75-foot zone down the rocky ledge, to some astronomical still water line, uh, astronomical still water tide line, you have automatically increased the area above the water that can be paved over. Uh, it's important to understand that in the 75 foot setback, excuse me. I'm sorry, your time is up, Mr. Bryant. All right. Thank you. I'd refer you to my letter, which, uh, which goes on to explain the other points I was going to make. And then I just might also mention that I think it's important that you, that you show, the, um, show the public exactly what changes will happen to the map, which is exactly the point made by the previous uh, speakers. Uh, Fred Aronson, 27 Lawson Road, same issues as the previous, and I think we're all kind of wondering what changes when the definition changes in terms of our properties. That's kind of the message here. There's also the concern about protecting the environment. So those of us who have bought property that is affected by the shoreline definition, wondering what happens to our property, our tax rate, our taxes, my property shrinks by a significant amount. Will my tax bill go down because my lot size has shrunk? 
I'm, that would be nice, but I've been paying for the lot size that I bought in 1997, and just like Bill, I'm wondering what's going to happen to that. So, and I have no way of knowing. I'm busy, I work, and uh, I can't read all the website connections that you provide and see the map here. I have no idea how uh, each of our properties is affected. I'm pretty sure that's what a lot of people are concerned about. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, Deborah Murphy, 24 Pilot Point Road. Maureen, you're fought the oh, Thank you. It just disappeared off the I have this on my machine, so if it, it hopefully it'll come up. Yeah, it's coming up. Should I let this load and let someone else speak in the meantime? Would you like me to do that? I'm sorry, say that again, please. Would you like me to let this load up? Because this isn't my machine. I'm having to use one here, and I'm not as familiar with it. And I'm clicking on it, and it's taking a lot of time. So yeah, I, I could sit down while it's loading. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to this issue while this computer while is doing while, its thing? While it's loading, sure. Uh, hopefully, I won't comment in a loaded fashion. I'm David Wenberg. Um, my wife, Ann Carney, and I live at 21 Angel Point Road and we, in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, and we also own 23 Angel Point Road. Um, we are writing in... Excuse, excuse me just a moment. What was your last name? We didn't... Uh, W-E-N-N-B-E-R-G. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, we are writing to support in part the proposed amendment, which is the movement to, from the mean high tide to the astronomical high tide, but like previous... Um, discussants, we oppose the addition of the three feet to the scientific measurement. We do so for a number of purposes, reasons. The first is um, we feel that the current, that the mean, astronomical mean high tide has a lot of science behind it, and there's a lot of justification for doing that. And, it, and we would, if Cape Elizabeth decided to add three feet, it would, it would um, depart from the standard that's now part of the National Geolog Geographic Geologic Surveys Research. The second one is while there has been concern about the adding the three feet to protect the short, the uh, high bank area, the converse is opposed for those of us who don't have a bank. So adding three feet for those of us who are non-bank um, shore owners substantially reduces the amount of land that would be available for us to build on because it effectively uh, moves the 75 foot back to a very large por portion. In fact, when we look at the storm surge map from Slavinsky, um, the majority of the property at 21.3 Angel Point would be within the 75 foot, which it's currently not from that standpoint. The second one, and this is, we feel that this really adds an undue burden um, to the property owner. The other part that's of note in the commentary is that the 75, that adding the three feet also mitigates issue in terms of storm surge. There's one question about the science from the storm surge, which is that it, it assumes that the storm surge would occur at the peak of the high astronomical tide, which was the map that was drawn. Uh, but because the probability of both events happening are relatively rare, um, then the 100-year flood rate, which was part of that underlying discussion, um, would be a very, would move it to much greater, much more than, less than 100 foot part. And then the last part is that the 75 foot bank and uh, cutback, setback, excuse me, for building, essentially also is, approaches the attempt to reduce the storm surge um, and this is already built into the 75 foot from the astronomical high tide or the current mean high tide. So for those reasons, we would uh, oppose adding the three feet to the astronomical high tide. Thank you. Thank you. Does it look ready? It, it looked like it was. Um. Close 
Okay. Let's see. Get rid of this. Okay, this... Uh, Mrs. Murphy, just oh, as a reminder, you should will have, I have, to say you'll have three minutes. Yes. Um, this is a, a depiction of our current shoreland zone. Um, it's a digitized data set that was taken from our official zoning map. The person that drew our zoning map drew it by hand. Her name is Chris Summers many, many years ago. And to get into the digitized world, points were taken off of both sides of the zone, digitized, and then they're available in a KMZ file and you can load it. Our zoning map, if you overlaid it on this, it'll line up perfectly. So it's very accurate. So we have new technology, uh, robust technology on Google Earth where the folks that have been asking, you can actually go on your lot and you can see what's going to happen, except for on this map, I don't have resource protection um, information, and that's, that's a whole different ball of wax. So for th those of you that are inland, it'll be a different story. But I wanted to show you what I would do if I were the code enforcement officer in Kate, um, and I had a lot where I was concerned someone wanted to do a project. So on this lot, and I'm going to turn on hat, hat, hat plus three, which is just a, a 1.2 inches lower in elevation than has. This is so different than my computer. This is awful. It's not. Um, I'll try to do it. Okay, so I'm going to measure. If I were to get this, I would measure this house right here. If they had, uh, and I think there might be a building permit. If I measure from this line, which is the shoreland zone line today, to the house, yeah, this is way off. This is totally way off. Can I just plug my computer in with the same thing? I sent it today. This is, this is not good. <laughs> well, I've got, I have one minute left for you, Mrs. Murphy. Um, I, you know. I've, I've given this information before the planning board. It's just loaded on this machine in this version of Google Earth. It's not working. Well, I believe we've all received everything to today that you sent. The council has received it all. But the public hasn't seen it, and I was hoping they might get a chance. The issue really is that the way in which we measure our top of the bank today has to do with the elevation of the top of the bank and the shape of our shoreline. It is not based on a contour line based on elevation, which has hat, all of that is. So the proposal is to move to a one elevation still water line and measure three feet up from it. But we have varying elevations on our shoreline from nine feet to 60 plus feet. So our, code, uh, our, off, uh, our municipal officers chose not to choose that th over 30 years ago because it didn't work for Kate. So I'm sorry I wanted to show you more, but I can't. But. Thank you. George Foley, 9 Pilot Point Road. Um, I think it's really important for us to see both the before and after effects. What is our current map look like on the ground, and what does the change look like? And I'm sorry that hasn't been presented. Um, I do have uh, pictures of the extreme effects of the tide, so that might help you realize it. Apparently, you have to submit it before noon, or it, you can't get on the agenda for it. So I just have it on disk and a picture format here. Thank you. Could you pass the photos around? There? Yeah. Hi, I'm Sheila Mayberry, okay. 3020 Road. I was here last time, uh, and I had sent a letter to you uh, dated 714. And um, based on what we've already heard tonight, I'm going to reiterate that 
you please have a workshop on these issues. Clearly, the public uh, uh, has legitimate concerns, uh, both re with respect uh, to the Rocky Ledge and with respect to how this impacts, this change would impact um, the inland properties. Uh, so I'm not going to, I was thinking about reading the letter to you that I wrote, but you have it, and I hope you please read it if you haven't already. Um, and I'm urging you, again, I, I believe that you do need a workshop on this issue. It would be premature for you to take a vote tonight based on what you've already heard. Uh, in addition, the information that Deb Murphy has provided to you uh, was um, produced um, by, she, she had professional help from uh, Mapper, and I think that you really do need to take a look at it. Uh, it's, it's very accurate, and, it, uh, and pictures say a million words. Uh, so this, you can really see what the impact, especially on the Rocky Ledge, would be. And please take uh, Mr. Bryant's um, analysis to heart as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Maynard Murphy. I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. I have emailed in some information regarding my concerns and opposition to adopting the proposed definition change to our normal high water line language. As I asked in that email of this past Friday, I stand before you now to ask that if you're still contemplating adopting this definition change, that you require a map comparison of the current shoreland zone with that of the proposed shoreland zone to see clearly how our shoreland zone will be affected. If the town adopts the definition change, the shoreland environment and the ocean environment will be negatively impacted by the polluted runoff from the additional impervious structures and surfaces that will be added in the affected areas. The alternative is to use the science in the mapping technologies available today and inherent in the digitized version of our current map in the back of the ordinance. The CEO and any property owner can do the overlay, print it out, and locate the boundaries on the face of the earth. We have heard that top of the bank has never been used in Cape Elizabeth and that the proposed change is no big deal. Well, in some places in Cape, it is a big deal because it moves the shoreland zone toward the ocean. And we have found some 11 properties where top of the bank has been used and eight of them are in the Registry of Deeds. Please request the comparison to make an informed choice. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Roy Strunk. We uh, live at Six Tides Edge and we own a rental property and cottage at 12 Tides Edge. Um, uh, this is very helpful to hear the comments because uh, I'm learning a lot of things and I think the suggestion of a workshop would be great. Um, my big concern, we've been hearing it, is that I think the proposed, um, uh, the proposal is kind of a one-size-fit-all solution. And we have a very diverse coastal community. And our particular property has a very low apron, low slope to the water. And so we would be dramatically affected by this, this change. Yet, what's beautiful about our property is we have this huge barrier of rocks. It's like, an, it's like a sanctuary. And those rocks have been there for hundreds of years and have protected this property. You know. And I've been living there since 1996. My worries have not come from the ocean. It has been stormwater. Stormwater affects our neighborhood way more than the ocean. And uh, there's some neat things that the town has done, which they did on Shore Road, and they put the new piping system in that's helped with the, sh the uh, those storm waters. But your this proposal with a one size fit all, you've heard how there's so many people with different t pieces of property that this three foot mark will has pros and cons all up and down. So I don't know the solution, but I think the one the one one size fit all is not the solution. Um, so 
thank you for my uh, hearing me out today. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jay Chapness. I live at 5 Waven Road. Uh, <clears throat> I'm addressing you this evening as uh, a prior member of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. I had the opportunity to serve on the zoning board for almost 10 years. Several of those years I was chairman of the board. Uh, we ran into a number of cases uh, addressing this exact issue. Uh, one landmark case was a property on Lawson Road maybe 12, 15 years ago that all, went all the way to state superior court. Uh, they ruled in favor of the code officer's determination and, and the homeowner. Uh, the current, even though that's the case, that it ruled in favor of the code officer, the current code is very uh, confusing in some aspect, obtuse and contradictory. Uh, top of bank is not an effective use uh, determination. I am speaking this evening in favor of uh, Code Officer McDougall's recommendation that a concrete verifiable uh, determination of the high water mark be used. It's the same method that's used by the state um, and, and is endorsed uh, is, is the astronomical high tide. Is a, the state is about to uh, shift to that method is my understanding. Uh, I support that. I do have severe concerns about adding the three feet, three vertical feet, to the astronomical high tide. Ast astronomical high tide is already a significant high tide and provides effective barrier for the shoreland zone. Adding three vertical feet uh, could impose some unintended, unintended consequences to homeowners. Um, I. Uh, there are properties that might be affected as far as renovation or enlargement, and those homeowners don't know today that the three vertical feet could adversely burden their property and make it difficult to do a very logical improvement or modification on the property. So again, in summary, I support a concrete definition, the high water line. I'm speaking to you tonight, although I do own property in the shoreland zone. My property is completely within this, the shoreland zone and will not have, be directly affected by this. So I'm speaking to you tonight as a former zoning board uh, uh, member and, and I support the changes. I do not support adding three vertical feet to, to the astronomical high tide. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no further uh, citizens, I'm going to close the public hearing. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask the town planner if she would step forward, because I'm sure there are probably counselors. I, I certainly have a question or two. The counselors might like to ask something of the town planner. Um, <clears throat> so. I had been asked to kind of give you an overview again of this. Is that something you're still interested in? Or? Yes, I think that would be. Okay. Then I'd be most I, welcome. I'm going to go as quickly as I can. And if there's something that you want me to cover that I haven't covered, please just say so. But I'm just going to pull that up and use it as a reference. Um, you know, in these situations, I think it's good to remember why we started here, and I specifically want to remember because uh, the code officer didn't make it tonight, and I'm here. Uh, so this is a recommendation from the code enforcement officer. He asked for a change to the current definition. Uh, he said that during my first five weeks as code enforcement officer, the biggest question for me has been, how will I interpret the definition of normal high water line of coastal waters? On the one hand, it could be interpreted as the top of the bank, but this is a subjective measure, and it could sometimes cause a line that is 50 to 80 feet landward of where the highest tide of the air actually goes. On the other hand, it could be interpreted as the limit of staining on rocks. This measure could create a line that is seaward of where the highest tide of the air actually goes. 
in my opinion, it is not in the town's best interest to have a definition in the zoning ordinance that could cause 80 feet of variability in a zoning line. The past practice of the code enforcement officer making this subjective determination on a case-by-case -case basis exposes the town to litigation. I would recommend that the town have a definition that enables land use professionals to determine the line based on objective and scientifically sound criteria. So that's why we're here tonight is the person who is most responsible for interpreting the normal high water line is saying that the definition you have is vague. And I could go in and quote the decision of the Mack case and the decision of the Armstrong case, which Mr. Chap referenced. And in those cases, the Mack case, the court actually said the normal high water line could be multiple things based on your current definition. So the code officer is saying, I need, I need to have one place where I identify as the normal high water line. And I would like it to be something that can be consistently applied by a variety of land use professionals and something that is based on science. So that's where we started on this. Uh, this was recommended to the planning board. The planning board worked on it. And the first thing the planning board did, in, and let me point out, the planning board had eight workshops. They had three public hearings. Uh, they spent a year on this. Uh, so while the council may, I like to think of the council as benefiting from the fruits of their labor. Uh, but they did start with going with the standard state definition, which most of us call the highest annual tide. And they got blown away at a July workshop a year ago. And they were told, you're being too weak. You are weakening the, the town's env stiff environmental protection that the town always wants. And the board stepped back and said, well, we never wanted to weaken our standard. And they, they started all over again. Uh, we brought in Pete Slavinsky from the Maine Geological Survey. You heard almost essentially the same presentation that the planning board heard. And that presentation talked a lot about sea level rise, about storm surge. It gave you data on where sea level rise has been happening nationally and in Portland Harbor and in Portland Headlight. Uh, and so out of that came two things. One was um, even, the main, even the main DEP, who's got this highest annual tide definition, is considering a recommendation from the Maine Geological Survey to move to the highest astronomical tide. It's a good number because it's a much more stable number for property owners. It's calculated once, and it stays that way for 20 years. So if you build a house based on that number, and five or 10 years later, you go back and you want to do an addition, the number is probably still in the same place. The highest annual tide moves every single year. So there's some equity, not just for a property owner, but there's equity for multiple property owners sharing a coastline. Uh, but the other thing that really was uh, playing with the board was this whole idea that the existing definition talks about the extreme limit of the tides. And there was no desire to get away from the town's tough environmental protection. So how do we capture this concept? And we did look at trying to identify the top of the bank. Um, I spent some time looking at some ordinances on the west coast where they have some serious issues with the, the soil eroding. And even where they have the most basic idea of the top of the bank, where I could take all of you out there and you'd say, yeah, that's where the top of the bank is, because the bottom of the bank is right there. Um, they don't even have a definition of top of bank. So while the board discussed that, in the end they decided we needed to go with something else. And we get to this whole plus three feet. Why go with plus three feet? Well, the first reason is um, you build on the highest astronomical tide, which is a number that has a tremendous amount of scientific data. but do you really want to get back into the whole subjectivity that is the problem with our current definition? Or do you want to use something that is clearly measurable that most land use professionals could go out and come up with the same answer? So that's why the concept of a vertical foot came into play. Because you can pick the highest astronomical tide, and then it's fairly easy and pretty consistent to say, OK, we're going to go up one foot, or two feet, or three feet, or five feet, or whatever the number is. So three feet to get to the last one. So one, foot is a good way to measure because it's consistent. The second one is that the current definition does anticipate the movement of water. And if you think of the numbers we're using, they're really kind of like the bathtub line. Um, and during a storm, 
you know, things are sloshing around. And our current definition really takes into consideration that whole idea of sloshing and spray of the water. And so that's another reason why it's really hard to figure out where the water is sloshing because during a storm, most people are in the house. And three years later, how do you figure out where that line is? Do you ask the code officer to go out there and kind of do this, which is basically what they're doing now? Or do you say, okay, we know there's some, some sea level rise, we know there's some storm surge, we're gonna pick a number that makes sense. Um, and then the third thing is, they looked at the data and you have in your package from the planning board a lot of data. You have data about um, different storms and what we know about the 25 biggest storms that hit this coast is the storms that had the biggest storm surge. We were very fortunate that they hit during low tide. And if you look at that chart, you will see that if even one of those storms had hit at a higher tide, um, there would have been significant flood damage. So I can read, and I don't want to do this to you, I can read the data, if you want, that talks about the 100-year floodplain levels, the storm surge levels, but the, the three feet was a number that was a compromise. It takes us a long way down the road towards protecting properties and protecting uh, people's lives during significant storm events. Does it protect us during the 100-year storm? No, it falls about 0.7 feet short of the 100-year storm. But it's almost where we would be during the 50-year storm. Does it protect us during the biggest storm surge? Uh, no. But it gets us a lot of the way there, and there's some compromise in this. Uh, I'm going to go to one more thing, and that's the current mapping. Uh, again, I have lots of documents here. Um, the person who created our current shoreland zoning line, which is this line right here, um, I knew her personally, and if she was alive today, she would say the same thing that Judy Colby George said in her memo, and that is that taking data that's on a piece of paper and digitizing it so that you can project it on a computerized image does not make it more accurate. It, it's only as accurate as it was the day it was created. And taking this line and just projecting it on an aerial photo does not make it accurate. We have, and I can, I can read it if you want, I'm not seeing anyone wanting to be reading to it, but Spatial Alternatives, who is our GIS consultant, our go-to person for creating our, all our zoning products, even she's saying that, you know, our mapping is only as accurate as the least accurate layer. And the least accurate layer, we can't even determine how accurate it was because it was hand-drawn. So uh, what I can do is I, I've, I've heard the comments tonight about, and if you could just give me a moment, it's going to take me a moment to pull this up, that our current mapping is really great. And um, I have gone over our line with the code officer. We've gone through the whole coastline, and um, we, we don't agree that that's really the case. There's definitely places where the line looks like it's in the right place. Um, but there's also a lot of places where it, it doesn't look that good. And the point I wanted to make is that the Department of Environmental Protection require well, it's a state of Maine, requires that all towns who have coastline have to adopt shoreland zoning. And the financial resources of towns varies dramatically from southern Maine to northern Maine. And the DEP knew that a lot of towns were not going to have the resources they needed to very, very accurately map their shoreland zoning. And for that reason, they put out circulars and fact sheets on how to map your shoreland zoning. And they've, they've actually stated that the two methods that they talk about are what they call the elevation method and the visual inspection method. So what they want you to do is come up with a good definition of where the normal high water line is. But it's okay to go out there and just look and say, this is where the line is. It's also okay to adopt an actual number that's an elevation and say, wherever that elevation falls is where we're okay the shoreland zoning line is. And so what we're talking about is going from a rather crude but somewhat effective measurement, the visual inspection method, to a much more sophisticated, easier to identify, consistently applied elevation method. And that's what's proposed. So what I have, you've seen this before, and I showed you in the big picture because these orange areas and the dark orange areas are the hast elevations. 
Um, what I'd like to do is zoom in to the area. Let's just start um, maybe right below Seaview Beach. And let's go in a little bit further. And what you are looking at, this very pale uh, color is the Hast elevation. And if we go in really close, you can probably see that. And then, uh, and that's Hast zero. And then you've got this little slight bit of orange, which is Hast plus one, kind of a nice orange Hast plus two, and this darkest is Hast plus three. And then we turn on the shoreland zoning. And the shoreland zoning in this area suggests that this whole area out here is where you would start measuring the 250 feet from. But if you adopt the definition that we have tonight, <coughs> then the hast would be where this darkest orange would be. And the point here is that taking the shoreland zoning line that's on here and zooming in on it doesn't work in all different portions of the coast. There are places where it lands in the right place, where it really looks pretty good. But there's also a lot of places where it looks like this. And I can, I can keep going down the coastline, and you can get a sense of how it wiggles back and forth. Um, if you can imagine a cartographer sitting at her desk with a light table, um, squinting at aerial photos and drawing a line and doing the very best job she could do. Uh, but the HAST approach with the elevation data is more reliable. So I'm going to stop there and see if I can try to answer any questions. OK, thank you. Council Wagner. Yeah, Maureen, how did, you, how did you derive that light blue line? I mean, how did you? The light blue line, it, it, what it is, is it, honestly, it is, um, we created that line, I think it was in 1992. And so we took the aerials, the most current aerials we had at that time, and she sat at a light table with the aerials and a piece of mylar that had the town's parcel lines on it. You put the mylar over the aerials and you draw. And, and you know, she was very good at what she did. She had very high standards for quality. This was a very good representation. But we have never used this line and projected it to calculate setbacks. And I'm looking out here, and, and Ben has very carefully not been here. I'll speak <laughs> to him tomorrow. Uh, but we've had lots of conversations about this. And he, uh, as far as I know, he has never taken this line and measured back 75 feet to determine the setback. It's always been, you have to go out there, you have to look at the vegetation, you have to look at the staining of the rocks, you look at the elevation, and you figure out where you think that normal high water line is. And the, the, the real challenge is that, you know, you're very vulnerable to change in personnel, uh, change in time periods. Uh, he wants something that is more consistent. And this is a method that is more consistent. So just to wrap it up, like yep. the blue line has nothing to do with field inspections. No, right. no. Councilor Jordan. Uh, two questions. One, um, the gentleman in the front here mentioned that he just received a mailing about this public hearing. What other mailings have been sent out to residents in Cape Elizabeth regarding this? We sent out about 630 uh, mailings. And what I did using this system is I took, well, let me just do it this way. You see where these two blue lines are? Mm -hmm. So I took every property owner from here to about back here and identified them on a mailing list and sent them a notice that said that we're changing, we're considering changing the normal high water line. And there was a, an email address if you wanted to look up more information. My, my question okay. is more. Was it just for today's public hearing, anything that had to do with the planning boards, meetings, their public forums, did any mailings get sent out for those no, meetings? No, no. This is a text change. So because it's a text change, they're under our ordinance, we are required to publish a legal ad. And we did do that. 
Um, it's always been felt that this, even though it's a text change, it has a lot of import, a lot of weight, and it's important to send notices to the public. So we did send notices for this meeting. Okay. My second question is another gentleman, I'm sorry, I can't remember everybody's name, um, commented about the one size fits all fix that we're doing. In the discussions between the planning board and maybe some of the ordinance people could mention this too, was there any talk about creating maybe two shoreline zones, one that had a cliff and one that had the long rise of elevation so that, I mean, it's two drastic changes happening you know, within the same wording. I, I smile because I actually attempted to do that um, at great at Forest, excuse me, at Fort Williams Park, because there were still debates about where the current normal high water line is, and I tried to figure out a way to draw a normal high water line from the beach up to the cliff, and uh, the code officer was very displeased with me, and uh, I won't get that map out again. So no, the, the problem is the, the current uh, definition relies on the judgment of one person. And based on the court decisions we've seen, the court's willing to accept pretty much anything that person comes up with. OK, again, yeah. I think I'm not being clear. No. What, <laughs> sorry. The people that are talking about there's a cliff. Right. You have the astronomical high tide. You can't do it. Feet. And, and let me be, I, yeah, I tried to go from beach to rocky cliff and write that definition, the code officer was terribly no, 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 no. I'm, Okay, again, Yes. let me maybe spit this out, and then if we go with astronomical high tide yeah. for everything, yeah. okay, if you had a zone for mm -hmm. the people that live on a cliff, right. okay, that's going to mean one thing, astronomical high tide plus one plus two. Right. Right, it, it brings the, the shoreline zone out further so they can get closer to the cliff. But if you take the people that live on the Spurwink Marsh and you add the, have the astronomical high tide, which I'm all in favor of having a scientific line, that's great, but yep. when you add the three feet, it's not the same as adding the three feet to the cliff. You're taking like hundreds of feet into their property line. So that's what I'm saying is, is right. was there ever discussion of creating like an astronomical high tide and that's there, we'll go high tide plus three. There was, and, and the problem is the transition area, and that's why I keep bringing up the example for Fort Williams, because you've got a very low area where the beach is, mm -hmm. and then it very quickly rises up to the hill. Well, where's the transition point? And, you know, I tried to fudge it, and um, basically I was told, don't go there again, because, gotcha. I mean, that's the problem. Where, where do you transition from the low-lying? I tried to calculate if the slope was more than 25% for the first 75 feet, then you would transition to something else, and it just wasn't working. Councilor Sherman? Uh, I recall from one of the meetings or workshops that there was a discussion about the shoreland protection zones already protect mm -hmm. much of this area from yeah. any sort of development. Is there a way to navigate around this map and maybe show the public tonight an area where we would see those various lines and, and what the impact so, of this ordinance amendment would have? Are you all right with me using the Spurwink Marsh as a location? Yeah, that okay, makes sense. Okay, so let's, let's try that. And let's turn this, and if you just give me a moment. Maureen, this is what was used at our last ordinance committee meeting. Exact same. This was the exact same presentation that was made well, to the ordinance committee. Well, I improved. You know, it's actually slightly improved because we had a little clipping okay. with the Good. parcel lines. Okay, so here is. Let's just try to do this a little bit, and I I can zoom in if we I, we may want to zoom in a little bit just to give you a little bit more detail. So right here, this is the sewer treatment plant. This is Spurwink. This is the thread of the Spurwink River going out to the Spurwink Marsh. And what I'm going to do is turn on the Resource Protection District zoning that's already existed. Okay, so all of that area is already protected as part of resource protection. And because it's that dark green, that means it's RP1, so it also has a 250-foot buffer, which would be this right here. Soon, there you go. So this is all RP1 buffer. So all of this area is already very strictly regulated. In fact, pretty much 
all of the shoreland zoning regulations that the state imposes on us aren't as strict as what we already are doing to ourselves with our wetland regulations. But let's turn on the HAST layers. Okay, so what we're looking for, we can see the very pale, we can see up to the really dark orange, and what we're looking for is areas of orange that are beyond this line right here or beyond this line right here. And as you can see, all of that orange is already in an area that we strictly regulate for wetland protection. Okay? And I can do that in other areas where we have those low-lying wetlands if you want to see something else. Would anyone like to see another area? Didn't we do, didn't we do down by the Crescent? Did we do Crescent? Crescent Beach? Yeah. I mean, and we that do was, Crescent Beach. I mean, that was an interesting, um, there's some homes we there. We did do that, Crescent Beach. And we might even, you know, overlap into some other neighborhoods people are interested in. So just give me a moment to zoom. Let's see. Let's go out. And then let's go back in. She did. All right, so let's grab right here. Right here. The other, the other one that was interesting to look at was Pond Cove and the old colony. Yes. Yeah, which was a kind of an interesting illustration in where you were from an administrative standpoint. Okay, so hopefully everyone recognizes this is um, this is Two Lights Road right here. And then we've got Crescent Beach. This is the parking lot for Crescent Beach. And again, if we start with the Resource Protection District, okay, so a lot of Crescent Beach, no surprise, is in the RP1 wetland area. Then we add the mandatory 250 foot buffer. Ta da. And now we turn on the HAS layers. And again, what we're looking for is we're looking for any of this color here going out beyond the green that we already have. And as you can see, we may have a little bit right there. But other than that, here at, at Crescent Beach, all of that area that would be covered by HAST is already regulated by resource protection zoning. Um, you ready to go to Pond Cove now? Yeah, that would be worth looking at. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and the plus three is the, the dark duck orange. So let's turn that off. We're going to go to right here. And okay, so this is Pond Cove coming right in. This is Shore Road right here. This is the Old Colony Lane neighborhood. And this is that ocean area. And this was that area where we can see open water right here. We can see open water right here. Mm -hmm. We know from mapping that's already been done that this is an RP1 wetland. But some of our mapping, um, some of our RP1 zones aren't showing up on this map because we say that if you have the physical characteristics for a wetland, we regulate it as a wetland. If you don't have the physical characteristics, we won't regulate it as a wetland. And everything on here has to be field verified. And this is one of those areas where we know there's a wetland there, but it didn't get picked up in our wetland mapping. So if we turn on the wetland districts... Maureen, we, will Lawson show up on this? Uh, Lawson, yeah, and in fact, I can zoom in if you want to Probably see Lawson better. Probably should because we have better. a resident from Lawson here. Let's do that. And then I'll grab that. And okay, you want any deeper? Are you good? No, that's, that's okay. Good. So in Lawson, we don't have the same issues with wetlands. It's, it's, I can turn on, well, the wetland is turned on right now, and you can see Lawson Road doesn't have wetlands. But if we turn on the HAST lines, um, coming right in, you can see that there isn't a lot of difference because of the HAST plus one, HAST plus two, HAST plus three. Um, those, those plus one, plus two, plus three kind of stack right up on themselves pretty carefully. And I can turn on the shoreland zoning, although I, this is our line that we use now, but we don't use it. We show it on a map. And that is right there. 
Okay. And I can go out a little bit if you want to see a little more of the neighborhood. More? I'm going to excuse me. Um, <laughs> is, is that's the will of the council? What could we, Council Chairman? Uh, yeah, I, I, we could just go up the coast a little bit, but it appears sure. that it's not going to be terribly different as we go along here, but why not? The So, Maureen, what's happening there? That's the uh, low area that Mr. Strunk talked about. And that's showing Hast plus three, it being this is, this is falling underneath the 14.6 elevation mean low lower water. Chair, Chairman. The only, the only other area I would like to just take a quick look at is Shore Acres, since we've received a lot of correspondence from that neighbor, yeah. residents yeah. of that neighborhood. Thank you. Maureen, would you show us Shore Acres? Sure. Okay, you want to zoom in more, or is that? It's fine. Okay. So here, I can, you know, I can turn on the wetlands, but I can tell you right now, it doesn't have any impact. There's some way up here, but nothing along the coastline. And this is what Hast looks like here. And this is what, if you misuse our shoreland zoning line, what it looks like. So let me zoom in there for you. Any questions? So, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so, Maureen, is yes. it, would it be right, at least according to the the mapping that you've done there, that Deb Murphy would be right that this would be a relaxation of the uh, the current shoreline. No, no, no. And 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 this is why we don't project this line like this on a regular basis. Um, I don't issue building permits. Code enforcement office does. Um, ben has been asked repeatedly, find a building permit that's been issued based on this line right here. We have not found one. So it's almost, In, yeah. th this, the blue line is almost useless to us uh, because it's, it's not field verified and... Yes. Right. It's, it's great to have on here because it says, if I'm looking at a piece of property, oh, if I'm looking at this property, I need to look at shoreland zoning because it's representing that that property has shoreland zoning on it. But you can't take that line and zoom into it on a digital photo and say, that's exactly where that line is. You have to use the definition. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Maureen. Okay. Moving along, in order to continue on this item, is there a motion to approve the normal high watermark report from the Ordinance Committee and accept uh, the proposed amendment? Councilor Ray? Yes, I move to accept the changes to the zoning ordinance which includes the normal high water line zoning amendments. Is there a second? Seconded. Council Walsh, any discussion? Council Wagner. Yeah, I mean, although I serve on the ordinance committee and went through this, I, I'm still concerned about the, you know, what the public comments been tonight, that we still need more information. I wouldn't be that comfortable voting today on this ordinance. Um, I think there might be some utility in having at least one workshop. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm concerned about the takings implications. Um, it doesn't sound like you know Mr. DeSena would have a problem with Spurwink because he's already regulated under the current uh, wetlands ordinance. But I don't know what how the strunks would be affected. I just think they need more information before we make uh, an informed decision. I have some of the same concerns after what we've heard tonight. It's obvious that the public has not been as properly informed as we have. I know we were all asked to attend the ordinance committee meeting so that we could be caught, brought up to speed on this complicated issue and maybe a workshop with some notice out to people that are going to be affected by this would be beneficial to the citizens of the town. I also have some concerns with the plus three. I completely 100% agree with needing to have a scientific line so that there's no open for interpretation. I think the astronomical high tide is a great idea. It sets it and its name says itself. It's the astronomical high tide. It's, you know, it's pretty high to begin with. I'm not sure we need to be adding the three extra feet because that seems to be, as we saw, what creates a lot of the, the concern with the takings. Okay. Anyone else? Councillor Ray? Um, I just want to point out that when the Ordinance Committee met um, the last time and voted three to nothing to send this to the Town Council, as is, um, one of the um, pieces that the Ordinance Committee was very clear about was that there was a communication to property owners that might be impacted. And I think you heard Maureen say there were 600 mailings. 630. 630. Um, so, um, uh, you know, we were very cognizant of the fact that if we were going to affect somebody, we wanted to make sure that they knew about it. And I know that the planning board wrestled with this for over a year, I believe, before it came to the ordinance committee. So um, there were many, many opportunities to speak. And I hear what people are saying tonight, um, that they've just found out about this. And I, I appreciate the fact that Maureen did some um, mapping tonight to show people who may, maybe weren't up to speed on this, um, where, how this might affect their properties. But one of the things that struck me when we did the work was that most of the HAS plus three didn't even come close to our already wetlands zoning ordinances. So for people who think that this is going to affect them, they were already affected by our wetlands ordinance. So um, you know, we went over that. Um, multiple times um, in the ordinance committee. So I just, I just want to bring that piece forward, so. Thank you. Councilor Jordan? Just quickly to rebut what she said, I, I agree the wetlands already protects it. So we saw that one piece of property that over near Pond Cove, I don't know how far down the shore Ryan we went, went that there's no wetlands protection and there was a huge plus three blob of orange on there that's taking somebody's property that's not taken at this point. So I'm just concerned with how many other instances are happening with that plus three within the town. Okay. Council Walsh? Uh, I talked to Maureen this afternoon and I wondered if she might be able to come back and explain the plus one, plus two, plus three as it relates to the hundred year um, storm, if you will. Um, one of the emails we received, I think it was today, because most of what we got was today, um, sort of related to the fact that Peter had not substantiated in his presentation the use of plus one or two or three um, from a scientific standpoint. So I don't know whether it's possible. The other piece that for Caitlin, that was really, that's the old colony um, road issue. And I don't know whether that's worth showing again to clarify for Caitlin what that does because that large orange space that she is claiming is taking from those landowners is in fact land that may, if you put some of the other parameters on there, she'll see that it wasn't to be built upon anyway. Um, just, you know, it might be worthwhile, so. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Council Walsh. So again, it's gonna, I apologize, but it's going to take me a moment. Come on. Yeah. 
So what I'm going to reference is the report from the planning board to the town council um, where they go on at length about uh, the justification for plus three as opposed to any other number because the planning board also discussed was three feet the right number, was it two feet, um, do we need to have a number. Um, so right here, here's your chart. Right now, highest astronomical tide is 11.5 and the hast would be 11.6. So you're going up 0.1 to go from the highest annual tide, which is the state standard definition, to the highest astronomical tide. So that's not a huge difference. Um, but most of the plus three was really a nod to the town's existing definition. Um, <coughs> the planning board noted that the top of bank definition in the Mac versus the town of Cape Elizabeth case, that's the 1983 decision, include the concept of establishing a line that reflects the extreme limit of the effect of the tides during a storm event. So Mr. Slavinsky provided information about water levels during storm events. So storm surges, and he's collected information, well, he hasn't, but we have information that's science based from 1912 to, 19 to 2012. And in the storm that happens, every year, um, you have a surge of 1.1 feet, going all the way up to the storm that you have a 2% chance of it happening every year at 3.3 feet. So at 3 feet, you're protecting yourself from the storm that ha has a 4% and a 2% chance of happening. So that's where you start to get that 3 feet. And clearly, you could have gone higher than that because this is the storm surge before you start factoring in more of the movement of the water. Um, then the board looked at, let's see, keep going, and we have another great chart from Pete Slavinsky. And these are the top 25 storm tides. And the real interesting thing is the blue is the, uh, the tide at the time the storm hit, and the red is the surge. And you can see, you know, this 1991 storm, the perfect storm, came at a very low point in the tide. And if this storm had hit right here, you would be way above where we are. So what we're looking at is 14.1 is our record. But the only reason 14.1 is our record is because a lot of the really worst storms happened when we were at low tide. Uh, and then Pete did provide some more information about uh, the fact that we are, the trend is towards more storms, towards more severe storms. So we are trying to plan into the future. And I'm not going to paraphrase uh, Planning Board Chair Victoria Valent, but she really put a lot of effort into this. And she will explain that the benchmarks for a minor, a moderate, and a severe coastal flooding in Portland Harbor are 12 feet, 12 and a half feet, and 13 feet. And remember, it has plus three gets you at 14.6. So 14.6 gives you some room for that severe storm, but you still need to think about the spray and the movement of the water. And I know I, every time I talk about the movement of water, I have to move my arms. But um, the use of the highest astronomical, she, she's got some stuff in here. The highest astronomical tide is 11.6. Three feet would be 14.6. The 100-year storm tide level reaches 14.1. And severe coastal flooding is at 13 feet. So that one foot that you're looking at is really not that much when you start thinking about the tossing of the waves during a storm. But that's where that plus three came from. Does that help a little? Yeah. Appreciate that. Okay. Anyone else while Maureen? And there was, there was a question Old about Pond Cove and the blob. Old Colony. Excuse me? Old Colony. Old Colony, yep. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we'll do this again. Okay. We were up the coast and we weren't in Old Colony. Yeah. This will just do the whole point is to do it. I should go do it again. Looks like it just takes out. Okay. 
And in this area, again, what we, I think Caitlin's concern was with the blob that was just north of here. Right. But this is a wetland, so this is not showing up in our wetland mapping, but it is regulated as a wetland. This is a wetland as well, and it is showing up in our wetland mapping. So here's your RP districts, and then you add your RP 250-foot buffer right about now, and then you have the hast layers, and you've got this orange showing up here but we know that this area has been mapped as an rp1 we've had people submit building permit applications do the wetland mapping it it definitely meets the criteria for an rp1 so this is also in a wetland already so i think the concern was with the blob to the north the blob yes, thank to the north. you and um i guess what i would caution the council is this is really an awkward form for making determinations about individual parcels. Um, I have been on that property. It is very low at that point. Uh, and I, I don't think, I know I'm not going to make any judgment for the code officer about how that would be applied. Council Chairman. Uh, and I can't remember which of us asked this question. It could have been me for all I can recall. But it, somebody asked about an inventory of properties that would perhaps be adversely affected by this ordinance change where suddenly they're going from a property that may have more development potential to having none or significantly less. And from what I'm gathering from tonight's presentation, in order to do that property by property, you would actually have to go out there, uh, if you're the CEO, and visualize the top of the bank and then have a right. way to draw that line and then compare it to the highest astronomical. That's value. always been the biggest struggle is typically when you do an amendment, you want to know where you are now and what, how much of a change there is. And we don't have town-wide data of where we are right now because every single point has to be verified by the code officer standing out in the field saying this is the point. And that has been um, the issue the code officer has had and why he came to you in the beginning and said, I would like something uh, that's clearer. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Wagner? Yeah, Maureen. Um, yep. With the uh, resource protection ordinance, um, yes. I know there's some variances you could request if you, if you have an application for a project on your property mm -hmm. and there's you know, a list of whatever, 20, 30, 40 mm -hmm. um, things that the code enforcement officer can go through and determine whether or not they recommend giving a permit. What about with a shoreland zoning? Would you have that same flexibility or? You actually have more flexibility with shoreland zoning. My experience has been that, y yes, you can ask for variances with the resource protection, but you can only ask for certain variances. And if something is not permitted, if it's a no, you can't get a use variance. So our experience has been that, you know, it's not unusual for a property to have a base zone, to have an overlay zone, and to have shoreland zoning. So you've got to meet the standards of every single zone. And in our experience, when you have that situation, more often than not, it's the resource protection district that is the strictest and the one that will trip you up. Um, the shoreland zoning, even if you're within 75 feet, if you're an existing structure, you still have some opportunity to expand. If you're within 75 feet of an RP1 wetland, you don't. Okay. Anyone else? Council Wagner? Um, with Pilot Point Road, some of those houses that are recent, I mean, recently built, I don't know how recent, but, but they would have been built pursuant to the current shoreland zoning ordinance. The current definition of normal high water line would have been the basis. And, and what would have happened for the permits that were issued out there is the code enforcement officer would have gone out there, he would have used the current definition and said, this is where I think the normal high water line is. Right. And some, some of those houses were built in an area that, according to Ms. Murphy, you wouldn't have been able to build on. But the code enforcement officer determined that you could. And I'm, I'm going to avoid answering that. But I am <laughs> going to tell you that the planning board um, used as an example a property in that neighborhood that had gone to the planning board for a permit. And the site plan showed nor top of bank and showed a different line for the normal high water line, and the code officer accepted that. 
And it was, it was one of the examples the board used of how this current definition isn't being used to identify the top of the bank. It can be used that way, but we have yet to find a situation where it's being used that way. Uh, so that's my point. It, it uh, is today. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, uh, yeah. Mike? I just want to clarify along Pilot Point Road, most of those homes were actually built quite some time ago. They did additions and renovations, which were substantial, a number of them. And there, there are specific standards for what you can do with the renovation, how much you can change the slope of the roof, how much square footage you can add. So that there's another whole element that comes into what has occurred on Pilot Point Road that is still being debated in the neighborhood uh, as we sit here. Anyone else? Maureen. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments by council before we call the vote? All those in favor? Opposed? 5-2, the motion carries. Next item, number 110, Thomas Memorial Library renovation project presentation. Very exciting that with the library we are here at this point in time, and I would like to... Take a quick break. Let's take a five-minute break. Thank you. I've been able to get up and stretch you guys. I can. It's really stuffy. It is stuffy. Getting ready to convene, to reconvene, I should say. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And it's Thank you. If you could take your conversation um, outside so we can continue our meeting. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Item number 110, <laughs> Thomas Memorial Library Renovation Project Presentation. So I'll repeat, this is exciting that we are here today after, I would say, two years and a lot of hard work. I'd like to uh, ask uh, Councillor uh, McCausland, who has been the chairman of the Library Building Committee, to introduce the item. Great. Thank you. We'll have a chance in a few minutes to uh, make a motion on, actually I think we're making four motions tonight, voting on them. But before we do that, I'd like to um, 
give a very brief history of our project um, and then introduce our design team and let them give you all an overview of what they have been working on for the last eight months. Um, we, as you may remember, two years ago had a failed referendum in 2012 on an earlier proposed project. And at that point, the council appointed the library planning committee to review all the work that had been done summarizing the building's deficiencies to assess the current and future community needs for programs and services at the library and to consider alternative ways of providing those programs and services. Ultimately, the planning committee recommended a 16,000 square foot, $4 million project comprised of renovation to the Pond Cove Annex building and some new construction. In January of this year, the council appointed the building committee to implement those recommendations. And since then, our committee has met regularly to finalize the plans and the pricing. The design team has worked with a number of constituencies, including the TML staff, parents and other patrons, trustees, IT staff, and school personnel. And because we as a building committee thought that the public input and awareness was so critical, we had a presence at a number of community events throughout the last several months. We've also held informational sessions. We've sought input from the public in a variety of different environments. I'll talk about those in just a minute. We made an effort to reach into the community, though, and learn exactly what it was that residents felt about the library and what they viewed as the needs for the town. The last thing we wanted was to deliver to the community a proposal that failed to meet residents' needs and expectations and which was too expensive and out of character with the library's environment and with the town culture. So over the last several months, we met with interested community individuals and we've given them tours. We met regularly with school administration and staff and with representatives from community services. We met with the folks from the Historical Society. We have maintained bulletin boards, a suggestion box, a page on the TML website. We have been pretty good about keeping folks up to date on the project and the progress of our committee's work. We've also worked with a CEHS student, Tucker Pillsbury, on an STP project that produced a video. And that video is available on the TML website. And if you haven't seen it, it's terrific. It's worth spending the, I don't know, three or four minutes to take a quick watch of that. It's really excellent. Our committee has also been responsible for writing articles to the Courier. We have hosted a reunion of students who attended the Pond Cove School, also a really fun afternoon. Uh, we had a presence at the Memorial Day Parade and at the Farm Alliance's Strawberry Festival. We also hosted over 200 people at the first ever Library Fun Day. And finally, we've had a presence and we have distributed brochures at all of the summer programs and concerts and will continue to do that through the fall. We've had very positive feedback and enthusiastic response to the project. And the project did receive unanimous approval from the planning board at its July public hearing. Very exciting. In just a moment, the members of the design team will present an overview of the project design and the budget for your review. Before we do that, I would like to thank the members of the Library Building Committee who have worked so hard on this project. Martha Palmer, Frank Governale, Kate Williams Hewitt, and Councillor Kathy Ray for their participation. And I'd also like to extend our thanks beyond that to some of the other um, supporting members of our committee, Library Director Jay Sharma, Principals Kelly Hassan and Jeff Shedd, Facilities Manager Greg Marles. And last but not least, I would like to thank the trustees and foundation members who have so graciously donated time and talent to our efforts to date. And just a couple more thank yous to a couple of people who really have gone um, out of their way to help on this project so far. Um, and that would uh, be a short list of people, but I'd specifically like to mention George Morse, Blaine Grimes, Bill Maxwell, Ruth Ann Haley, uh, Sarah Lennon, and Bev Sherman. At this point, um, I would like to just finish by saying that our proposed plan carries on a 70-year tradition in Cape Elizabeth of enhancing and upgrading 
library facilities every 20 years or so. That tradition was interrupted by the failed 2012 effort. I hope at this point we'll renew that tradition with an affirmative vote this year. And at this point, I will turn things over to the design team and I'd like to introduce Cynthia Lobenstein and Dick Reed from Reed and Associates Architecture. And I'd also like to ask Derek Converse from Zakow Construction to maybe hop up and join the presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. We could turn the lights off in the back so you can see the presentation a little better. <laughs> Thank you. It's like a jacket. Mike's getting a lot of spread tonight. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. This is an image of the site plan. I'm going to just explain a little bit about uh, what we had tried to accomplish in the site plan. Uh, this project offered an opportunity to create a pedestrian connection between the library and the elementary schools that support and encourage shared resources. By removing the 1985 connector building, it opened up the space between the town center and the school, schools providing a more welcoming environment for everyone in the community. It honors the history and the heritage of Cape Elizabeth by retaining the Pond Cove Annex building and the front lawn area by, re by improving the landscaping for outdoor performances in front of the building facing Scott Dyer Road, where concerts and activities are regularly held during the summer. It restores and repurposes the Pond Cove Annex building and constructs a two-story addition that takes advantage of the south sloping site to create an at-gray daylight lower level for the children's area, complete with an outdoor play space and an outdoor reading garden. The two-story addition maximizes green space <coughs> while it minimizes the building footprint, exterior surface area, area, and thermal envelope. This reduces site costs and also energy consumption costs. The Spurring School remains available for other uses and serves as a temporary library during construction. We've expanded the parking, which complies with both the program needs and the planning board requirements. The parking has improved traffic flow, which makes it safer and more functional, and includes landscaped islands. The new drop-off area improves pedestrian safety, and new sidewalks expand the pedestrian connectivity with the town. This is a plan of the upper level. and. Uh, it starts with an inviting at-grade entrance court and lobby, which provides elevator access to both the upper and the lower levels. Both levels conform to the requirements of the American with Disabilities Act and are completely handicapped accessible. A community information area, a digital bulletin board, and a donor wall are also included in the entrance lobby. The stair leads up to a centralized circulation desk which is punctuated by a circular skylight. The north-south axis of the building is terminated on one end with a glassed-in stair that is incorporated into the existing Pond Cove Annex portico. This can be lit at night and act as a visual beacon for the library. The other end of the axis is a cozy reading area with comfortable seating. Adjacent to the circulation area is space for processing interlibrary loan materials and staff work areas and offices. Near the circulation area is adult media and new books. Ample space for computer users is also located at both sides of the circulation desk for assistance and visual control by the library staff. The young adult area will have its own identity but is located in close proximity to the circulation desk for st and staff for better control and supervision. Smaller study rooms and a media lab with glass walls are available for young adults and other patrons to work in groups. In the adult fiction area, there is open flexible space allowing for the rearrangement of functions and furnishings with minimal impact on the building and infrastructure. 
Study carrels and seating areas are along the windows overlooking a planted green roof and the children's garden below. Book stacks are located on the interior. The adult nonfiction and periodical area is located towards the front of the building and includes flexible space for both reading and studying. An inviting window seat is visible from the exterior entrance court. Show the window seat right there. This is the lower level. The stairs to the lower level lead to an inviting wood paneled gallery and lobby with cabinets and wall space for art displays. It can be accessible by the elevator as well. Off the gallery is an at grade daylight children's area with flexible space for reading and programs, including a space for the family place library. There's a circular window seat area for more intimate story time activities. The children's circulation desk has visual control over the children's area, the children's bathroom, adjacent gallery stairwell, and the entrance to the outdoor play space. The outdoor play space has activity areas for young children, gathering places under a covered porch, and seating for parents. During non-library hours, the children's room and the upper level are secured allowing community members to use a variety of spaces. Students could use a lower level media lab after hours to make a movie for school on a Sunday night. The knitting club members could host an evening, pro evening meeting in program space number two. Or a book club could have a reception in program space one and use a kitchen across the hall. The large dividable meeting room, program space number one, accommodates up to 130 people and has a storage space for chairs and tables adjacent. The existing floor structure in this area will be reworked to increase the ceiling height. Public bathrooms and the elevator are accessible to all during the non-library hours. There is additional support space such as the janitor's closet, server room, break room, and mechanical electrical rooms in the lower level. A new glass enclosed stairwell brings natural light into the lower level lobby and gallery and is another means of, of egress. This is a view approaching the library from Scott Dyer Road. The, com the completely renovated Pond Cove School Annex building is on the right. A new drop off area and covered entrance canopy are centrally located. The addition incorporates roof forms, materials, and proportions that are compatible with a historic Pond Cove school annex and conform to the town center design standards. The existing and new construction will incorporate sustainable design strategies, proven materials, equipment, and technologies that are durable, low maintenance, and energy efficient. The new reading garden and pathway to the lower level green spaces are framed by the new addition on the right and the historic Spurwing School on the left. This is a view standing in the north-south axis looking towards the circulation desk and glass stairway to Pond Cove Annex Portico. On the right is the entrance stair and the elevator. A circular skylight is a welcoming element in the center. This is the view of the lower level children's area looking toward the circular window seat and out to the garden and birdhouses. I don't know if you can see the birdhouses in this view, but they're there. Mm -hmm. uh, an undulating wood ceiling and wood ring panels highlight the small activity areas and reinforce the garden theme. In conclusion, we'd like to thank the Library Building Committee, which has led an intense process over the last year to learn the ways that the Cape community and the library currently work and understand the challenges of planning for the future. An important insight from this process is best summarized by a quote from a special issue on libraries and information by the Maine Policy Review. The quote begins, as libraries move into the future, we will continue to see a blend of the old and the new, end of quote. 
And although this, this quote is in reference to books and access to digital media and flexible space for new pr programming, we feel that it is it appropriate that the architecture of the new Thomas Memorial Library reflects and supports this blending of the old and new. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Molly, is, is Derek Converse? I can't remember. Is Derek going to speak to us at all? Would you, Derek, did you want to say anything or would you like to answer I questions can, can, yeah, in case yeah, anyone has a question? Okay. Would does the count any uh, questions from the council for actually for uh, Reed and Company Architects before I ask uh, Derek Converse if you'd like to make a comment? Any co questions for the architects? Okay. I, mean, oh, I don't want you to think the lack of a question. <laughs> so I don't, I'm not excited about it. It's it's it really looks beautiful, and uh, I am very uh, excited for these plans to be presented to the town at large. Um, so. Okay. All right. Council Wall. Wow. <laughs> just, where we are today, from where we were a couple of years ago, is just a tribute to the work that everybody's done. It's just great. I'm very proud of this, I really am. That's great, and by the way, I'd like to respond to that. If I didn't say it strongly enough before, we had a terrific library building committee we were working with for the last several months, and our design team, I think, has done a terrific job. And for those of you in the audience, if you can't see these renderings because they're a little pale on that wall, you can pop up and take a look at them over here. I do think they're pretty jazzy looking in, in live and in color. And I think that the um, reception area in particular and the children's area are pretty exciting. And that children's area, if you look carefully, has some really pretty neat design elements to it. Does anyone have a question of Derek Congress? Hmm? Um, before I ask for a motion, I'd like to say something. This is. It's been just incredibly exciting and gratifying to see all the work that the building committee has done. A phenomenal job. Um, the design, I actually prepared something. The design team and the building committee's hard work has really paid off. They have sought citizen input throughout their entire process. This tremendous outreach effort involving a broad range of our townspeople, including school children and our elderly, has helped to shape an outstanding and creative plan for our library's future. This project will provide exceptional library programs, services, and opportunities for the next 25 years. And I'm highly confident that voters are going to approve it. <laughs> so to move along, may I have a motion? In fact, let me just back up. I would like to extend the courtesy of the privilege of making that motion to Council McCausland for her leadership on the planning committee, uh, the library building committee, and even prior to that, she was chairman of the library planning committee. So Council McCausland, would you like to make a motion to approve the building plan recommended by the committee subject to a vote of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth on November 4, 2014? I would. Thank you. <laughs> Good answer. I think yes, it's so moved. Short sweep. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> and is there a second? Councilor Ray. Second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Okay, item number 111. Thomas Memorial Library renovation proposed resolution and vote. I'm going to turn to Council McCausland again for this item. And um, what we have is basically an explanation in the beginning. We have uh, three pages of the bond language. Um, but we also, you know, we have the expenditure of four million. We have an, also an, a $200,000 contingency this is due to the language of our charter and as a result of the advice of our bond attorney. And we also have a sum of 150000 to approve. And what all this means is that according to our charter, the language states that any expenditure connected to this project needs voter approval. So I'll ask Council McCausland if she'd like to speak to this a little bit more. I will. 
I think that um, all of us on the building committee are committed to keeping costs down to the $4 million mark. I do think that providing that contingency means that we can responsibly address any surprises that we might find in a 100-year-old building and on a site that may have ledge. And so I think that uh, while we don't expect to need to spend that $200,000 contingency, I think we'd like the authorization in advance should the need arise. Uh, is there a motion? Councillor Walsh. Uh, I'd like to move that the Town of Cape Elizabeth, Maine, Town Council vote authorizing the expenditure of up to $4 million for renovation and expanding the Thomas Memorial Library and the establishment of a $200,000 contingency fund for unanticipated expenses of the project and an additional sum of up to $150,000 for providing temporary library facilities during the renovation project. The acceptance of the contributions from the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation and the expenditure of the same on the project and the issuance of up to $4 million in bonds to finance a portion of such expenditures. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilor McCausland. Any discussion? Councilor Jordan? Um, I just my looking over it says we're going to um, bond up to four million dollars. Where is the two hundred thousand contingency fund coming from, as well as the one hundred fifty thousand um, for the temporary library facilities? I don't know if somebody wants to talk about that. It was my impression going forward that all library costs were going to be included in the four million, including the temporary library facilities. So I'm wondering. If I misunderstood for a very long time, or if that jumped out for some reason, but I understand the 200,000 contingency. God forbid something was to happen; it would not be fun. But um, just a quick response to those things. Yep. If the town manager could respond, I, my recollection is the Spring Week School uh, was not included in the original budget. But let's ask and have Mike address those issues. Yeah, thank you. As the council chairman just said, the, the money is to renovate the Spurwink school, or the, the, the old library with the two doors, with the porch in the front and the back, uh, was only included in the original project simply to be able to, to do the little transition where when you tore down the connector, you still needed to be able to get in. Uh, when we looked at trying to use that for a temporary facility, there were some code issues with sprinklers. There was a need to upgrade certain uh, electrical needs. There was also some utility work uh, that, if for the eventual use of the building, that we wanted that we want to be able to do. Uh, the council has pre had previously authorized money for the former library project. There's about hundred thousand dollars left in that account uh, from from before. So of that 150, 100 has already been identified, and the the other 50, while there isn't a, a proposal this evening. Uh, my sense is, is that when this project began, there was a $100,000 loan from the infrastructure fund mm -hmm. to the library project. And if we do need that extra 50000 uh, I would likely propose at that time that we only repay back 50000 of that loan and that the other 50000 uh, be provided for the library project. Mr. Jordan? Just, and where the 200000 for the contingency fund will come from? And just so I know then, I wasn't totally crazy. We, it was originally included that the connector yeah. and using that as facilities for the temporary library was going to be included, but the improvements grew beyond what we thought, so we need to have our own fund. Is that, in a nutshell, what you just said? I think that, that when we had originally started with this design project, we were anticipating that it really would be as simple as Tearing down the connector and replacing an exterior wall and potentially putting in a new entryway that would be handicapped accessible. Um, since then, and again this is outside of the purview of the building committee and there, there are some other folks I think looking into these issues, but since then I think there have been a number of other items that have come up that Mike just delineated for us exactly. that had, um, I'll call that 
scope creep beyond just having to build an exterior wall. Gotcha. Council Chairman? Is my understanding correct that the money that would be spent the, up to the 150000 that although we don't necessarily know what use that building is going to be put to, that, that is work that has to be done in any event. So in other words, we're not spending it unnecessarily once the temporary need for that space for the library is over, we'll be still putting that money to good use for however the, that building is repurposed? Yes. Yeah. All, all of the discussions with that, that's been kept in mind. You know, for, for instance, one thing I did mention is toilets. Uh, the current toilets in, in no way meet code requirements. We'd be putting in new, new uh, restrooms uh, that would be fully code compliant. <coughs> Uh, in that section of the building, and whatever repurposing the building might have, those toilets would be ready, set to go for whatever repurposing that there might be in the future. Council Walsh? Uh, question from Molly. Uh, in the four million, I believe the 350,000 that you have been spending up to now is included, is that correct? Correct, yes. That is included in the four million. It is, mm -hmm. okay. And again, that was an original question that Caitlin had asked early on in this process about making that expenditure right. not having essentially the vote of the community. So right. that will be in that $4 million. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I still Anything just else? haven't answered where the 200000 contingency contingency fund is coming from. Yeah. The, you know, as Councillor uh, Chairman McCausland of the Building Committee said, it's our hope that we won't have to come up with that money. Uh, that certainly, you know, I've been told by the building committee that, uh, that they want to keep the religion and keep it to four million. Uh, but yet, when we spoke to our bond council, they said, you know, you can't spend one penny over that million, no matter what you run into. And that wasn't a comfortable situation, needing to, you know, not be able to finish the building uh, part way through, uh, if it if it came to that. So, you know, if we did need to find that money, obviously I would look at that infrastructure fund again. Uh, and you know, beyond that, I think we'd have to look at our overall capital spending and reallocate resources. Uh, money just doesn't appear. Right. So it'll come out of the, our general budget. Not we won't be bonding for that two hundred thousand. That two hundred thousand. No, the, the bonding is limited to the four million. Uh, mm -hmm. The four million dollars. Governor, Council Chairman. And just to make sure I understand, the reason for including this two hundred thousand contingency <coughs> in this. Uh, and what we're sending to the voters is so that if we did hit ledge and we had to spend another eighty thousand dollars, we wouldn't have to go and have another vote. We wouldn't have to go back. To we wouldn't have to go back to the, to voters. the citizenry. Right. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, that's is it. That's it exactly. Anyone else? All those. Uh, 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 Council Walsh, Walsh moved, and we had Council McCausland second. Any further discussion? I'm eager to see what happens at the vote. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Item number 112, Thomas Memorial Library renovation proposed ballot question. Uh, Someone's a little distracted. Yeah. As drafted, could we have a motion to approve the proposed ballot question? Council McCausland. I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, proposed ballot question on the Thomas Memorial Library as it's outlined on item 112. Is there a second? Councilor Ray? Second. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Item number 113, approval of, the, of warrant of November 4, 2014. This is a municipal election warrant. Uh, I wonder if we could just ask the town clerk if she has any comments on this for us. It, it not only includes the library, but has other issues about absentee ballots and so forth. Yeah. So. If I could just, just take a minute, because I do have an addition as well as oh. the library was being presented. I, something else came to mind for this warrant. Again, this is for the municipal um, election warrant on Tuesday, November 4th. Again, we'll be voting for two town councilors, two school board members, and also I need to add they would be voting for one member of the Portland Water District trustees for a five-year term. Okay, um, that has come up since I, I uh, 
presented this warrant. Um, I thought we had another year on the trustee, but it actually comes up this year. Uh, and then you have the citizen vote on the proposed library project. Uh, again, it calls for the election at the high school gymnasium from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. It talks about absentee ballot processing, and basically absentee ballots will be available approximately 30 days prior to the election. We do have information, or will be having information on our website uh, for that as well. Anyone that needs to register to vote can come to town hall um, or on election day, proof of identity and residency are required. So again, it's as presented except for adding the voting for one member of the Portland Water District trustees for a five-year term. Now, could I have a motion to approve the municipal election warrant with the amended addition of the Portland Water District trustee? Council Walt? So moved. Is there a second? Council Wagner. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. And now, item number 114, update on collective bargaining negotiations with the Teamsters Citizens. representing... I'm Citizens. sorry, Councilor Shimna. Uh, there's a citizen opportunity. Oh, thank First. you. <laughs> We have an opportunity for citizens to discuss or uh, discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda. Seeing no one, I'll move on to item number 114. Update on collective bargaining negotiations with the Teamsters representing public works employees. Um, uh, we need to enter into executive session. Is there a motion to enter into executive session? Councilor Sherman? I move that we enter into executive session to discuss the status of collective bargaining for a successor agreement with Local 340 of the Teamsters representing public work staff pursuant to Title I of the Maine Revised Statute, Section 405.6D. Is there a second? Councilor McCausland? Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. 